Peace and blessings. And welcome back to the Heritage Hip Hop interview. Hey, look, not only do we represent hip hop in New Jersey, we're hip hop worldwide. And before we get started with this interview, we got to give a shout out to some of our sponsors. We got Shakai Clothing right now, and we have Total Truth Apparel by another rapper, uh, Brother Everlast. Nice. So they uh, support Heritage Hip Hop, and we want to support them by giving them a shout out. And today I have somebody on the show that embodies putting faith first to create an industry. Please introduce yourself to the people. The fact, no, it is. It's New Trail, the King's Kid, Step, Union County. They all hey, was good with you. We we good. Yeah, um, you lagging a little bit, so I'm gonna try to clear that up a little something. Huh? You got a little lag. Yeah. All right. So as we get as we go move move further, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you finally because I think this call has gone out for and like like for two years, <laughs> and I'm glad we finally uh, okay. got to connect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So. What part of Union County of New Jersey are you from? I'm from Rawway, born and raised. Okay, so as I do with Heritage Hip Hop, I like to always go into the heart of the area mm -hmm. of New Jersey and then talk about the MC. Yes. So the Rawway Linden hip hop dynamic has always been deep. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you think about hip hop in New Jersey, Essex County is where everybody focuses on primarily North Irvington, East Orange, and then Hudson yeah, County with Jersey City, but but a uh, Middlesex County and Union County had a lot of hip hop in it, and Rawway, Linden, and even Plainfield would come together yeah. and spar lyrically. How did hip hop touch you, and when did you first start seeing the hip hop in your environment? Well, that's a good that's a good um, question. Well, first, we need to know that my godfather is Tommy Jenkins from Cameo, and he's from Rawway as well. So I have him as a godfather. Then my father is a DJ, right? So you can imagine what my household was like. You know what I'm saying? So just from, the, for, you know, as far as back as I could remember, you know, just living and breathing music and hip hop. And um, what stands out to me as a pivotal moment is when I saw that OPP video and I saw the part of it that was shot in Rawway as Tretchen and was riding down one and nine. And I saw the hotels that's in Rawway, and I'm like, yo, you know, if, if they can make it and they live, you know, they 20 minutes away from me, you know what I mean? And they popping and they they doing legendary things already. Nobody knew at back then what it was about to be. You know what I'm saying? You see the OPP video on Video Music Box or whatever, and you like, hey, this is dope. You don't know this is literally about to be like a group that inspires everybody. You know what I mean? And just takes it to the max. But I remember that moment of being like, yo, I could take this serious if these guys from 20 minutes down the road is popping. I know I could take this journey. You know what I mean? And, um, so, you know, it's just always been in my blood, really. One of the most famous stories I've heard about you, which you could confirm or not, is mm -hmm. you did a, a, ex, a show in the auditorium and tore it down. What was that like when you was a youngin? Yeah, well, that's interesting. So then that causes me to back it up to even earlier pivotal hip hop moments. Uh, one of my earliest influences, I say about 10 years old, 1988, was Slick Rick, right? So, you know, because of his name, <clears throat> it's kind of caused the influence of my name. At first, it was just Nucci Rail, but then I changed it to Nucci Rail, the King's Kid, which kind of to me had the same kind of feel as like Slick Rick, the ruler, right? So around 10 years old is when I decided to like really start taking rap serious. And I started signing up for shows, right? So I signed up for this show across town. And Rawway is like one big family, but it, it's still, if, if you ain't from that neighborhood, you ain't from that neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? So the area where I did the show in, I'm not from over there. I, you know, got a lot of love over there, family over there, people's over there. You know what I mean? But I'm not from over there. But we went over there to do the show. You know what I mean? And, um... I tore it down, man. I, I, they, you know, a lot of people they didn't believe I was ten years old, but like, you know, I went in, had the crowd participation, and had all that. It was kind of like what the game is like today, because today is based on popularity. Fact. You see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. that's what it was back then as well. It was based on popularity. I'm coming through. 
my cousins is with me. They from the project, so they got a hundred kids with them. You know what I mean? I'm from an area called Down Brennan. There's a lot of kids in my neighborhood, so they all came to support me. So, of course, I'm 10 years old, right? I'm not going to, you know, I haven't been practicing my craft for 20 years. How good could I really have been, right? You can only be like a certain level of decent, but how do I win? Because it's popularity. I'm popular. You know what I'm saying? It was the same reason I made the football team. I was terrible at football. You know what I mean? But I was popular. You know what I'm saying? So I made the team. And, and for everybody, it was it's just so funny. It's a running joke now because that team ended up being undefeated. And, you know, you got cats who take football serious and play all hard, play their heart and soul out and can't catch an undefeated team. Then you got me that just jumps on the team just because it was cool to play football that year. And we go undefeated. It's hilarious. But it's based on popularity. You know what I mean? So that's what winning that show was. It was like letting me realize that as long as I stay popular, I can always stay relevant. You know what I mean? Popularity is one of the main things that gets people noticed, but skills, technique, and form is what mm -hmm. makes the MC proficient. Yeah. What was mm -hmm. American 21? How was that a stepping stone until you going into proficiency? Well, um, oh man, it was so pivotal. Let me tell you, because that was the album when I signed my first record deal with MCA Records. I had signed the deal a year before that with the union, which got me noticed by the people which could get me a uh, um, deal with MCA Records, right? So we working on the American 21 album and the album came out amazing. Um, a lot of executives in the studio at the time, a lot of artists who were just getting on at the time would be coming through. So it was like a real show off period, but I wish I would even lock down and focus more. I was having so much fun. MCA gave us a whole bunch of money. It's my first time recording in the big studios in New York City with a limitless budget, order whatever you want. You know, back then, I mean, if an artist needed a pound of weed to, to, you know, before he started, if you needed a gallon of Hennessy, if you needed five women, if you needed, you know, to be chauffeured in the new S4, whatever you needed, they got you. That's how they work. Whatever you need to perform. I see artists order some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? And I was I was relatively mild compared to that, but it was such a party recording American 21. A lot of it is like a blur because it was like we was just getting drunk first thing in the morning. We were just uh, it was just partying on the way to the studio, partying at the studio, recording while partying and then leaving and partying. So it was just what a 21 year old with some money and some success is going to be doing. And that's what the album embodied. You know what I mean? So that's why they decided, yo, let's call this American 21, because I was just turning 21. You know what I mean? I signed the first deal when I was just turning 19. I signed that one. I just turned 21. But uh, it was a good time. It was a good time. I got to work with Raekwon for the first time on that album. Um, you know, they asked me, hey, the MCA said, look, any artist you want to record with, name them, we'll get them. I was like, I got to do something with Raekwon. You know what I mean? Always been a big Wu-Tang fan. And they was expecting me to say like, okay, Timberland. Or da -da. And if I would have been thinking with all respect due to Raekwon, he's had hit records in my eyes. But if I would have really been thinking about longevity, I probably would have chose like, all right, bring Pharrell in here. You know what I mean? Or bring Timberland in here. Or, you know what I mean? Let me get something with Dre. But I was just thinking... With my music, I've always wanted to just have a good time. You know what I mean? And sometimes I wish I thought more business-like, um, but I just wanted to enjoy myself, you know? And, and I knew that I would enjoy sparring with Raekwon in that way. So he, he was on that album. DJ K Slay hosted the sampler for the album. Mad Rapper did all the interludes for that album. You know what I mean? So it would have been something classic, man. MCA folded, so they never put it out, but it would have been something classic. But it definitely teach me to sharpen my skills because there were so many people in the studio, you couldn't be whacking there. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got cast coming through, Ali Vegas. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, uh, I did stuff with Jay Mills. I mean, you had Jay Hood. Just, you know, it was an ill class I came in with. And like, Everybody would be in each other's sessions because all the all the executives was friends. Everybody that we was all signed to, they was friends. So you had to be, and then the DJs would be in there, DJ Envy in there, DJ Absolute in there, K Slay in there, 
you know I mean, Tony Touch in there. You had to be spitting. So, um, but I was already a person who just practiced so much and wrote so much. You know what I'm saying? Um, I literally went from just like, you know, just a person who doesn't even write a song format, just writes a bunch of verses to now you got a record deal and you got to come up with songs. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, I, it was a it was a short amount of time where I just had to sharpen it and, and get to it. You know what I mean? And we did a, we did a good job with that album. The thing I want to ask you about that was you were fresh coming into the game. Yeah. And you saw and was exposed to a lot of the things that makes the hip hop industry so cutthroat, killer, and mm -hmm. relentless. Yeah. As a as a as a philosopher, I want to ask you this. Why mm -hmm. do you think with you saying anything you wanted, they would give you? Why do you think if music and creativity comes for the soul, they would give you anything you want that can damper or contaminate your soul when you deliver your product because they're looking for a product that comes from the flesh right not the spirit so anything to make your flesh feel good and, and be in charge was what they were trying to do whatever you said you needed to perform and people were wrong but it's really whatever you need to suppress the pain whatever you need to suppress whatever's hindering you from being free you know what I mean? Because that's all a lot of that stuff is. It's just suppression, <clears throat> suppression methods, coping me mechanisms and stuff. You know what I mean? Getting drunk so you could be social because you're not comfortable who you are when you're not drunk, right? So you get drunk and now you're the life of the party. Well, why can't you be the life of the party without being drunk? Because you're not that comfortable in yourself. You feel me? So it's whatever to make you comfortable and to hide all your, all your, hindrances and all your all your shortcomings and all your insecurities whatever we can do to hide or suppress those we gonna do it because we just want that product right and they're not looking for a product that really comes from the soul they're looking for a fleshly uh cookie cutter product word that's interesting and i'm gonna ask you on this level most mcs have identity crisis Yes, because we grew up with PTSD and we grew up with trauma that's yes. not only outer, outer indicative, it's also introverted, personal indicative as well. Most young men grow up feeling like less than a man because not only the color of their skin, but because of their financial situation and the attention of the comp the, the, the uh, complementary sex. I don't say opposite sex, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get into the game. Now, before you even get into the game, entertainment is the way out. Like education was in the Booker T. Washington, W.E.D.B. Du Bois um, days. Yeah. As a person with a skill or talent, how do you cope with, uh, Lord Jamar used to say, I used to have to cope with being so dope. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. How do you cope with that gift, knowing what comes with it and how the people look at you before you even touch the game itself? Well, that's interesting because I've been an artist with that identity crisis. A lot of my earlier stuff, a lot of my mixtape stuff, I was talking absolutely crazy. Although it was how I felt, now in hindsight, I know I couldn't have backed any of that up. I was talking crazy. I didn't feel that way. I wanted to live. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to die. And I don't want to kill you. But this is what the people are entertained by, one, Number two, it's how I feel. I feel like if you run up on me, I'm shooting everybody, right? But that ha a lot of people get ran up on and they don't shoot nobody. Now, all grace to God never happened to me. I'm not one of them artists, never been robbed, never been ran down. No, people show me love because I've always been a generally cool person, never been grimy, never. There's nobody who could say Nucci did this to me. You see what I'm saying? Like Nucci did this grimy thing or he robbed me or he did me wrong and I don't have that, right? So it was never tested. But now I think about it, I listen to that stuff. That was an identity crisis. Who did I think I was? I don't know. This character I created protected me, right? It was a, it was a, it's like when I, I see you coming down the street and I don't know you and I'm walking towards you. So I throw my ice grill on, I throw my bop on, right? Throw that gel yard bop on throw that ice grill on, it, it protects me while I'm walking past you. You're going to leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? If you're a big dude, 
if I, I'm I'm six four, you know what I'm saying, three hundred pounds, you might cross the street because I'm I'm giving you that. Don't mess with me. That's not even how I feel inside, but it might even be how I feel at the moment. But even at the moment of testing that, then people realize it's not how they feel. This is what we see in interrogation rooms, right? We see tough guys crumble. This is what you see in jail. You see tough guys. And I, I never did no time in jail. You see tough guys crumble, right? So identity crisis is, is real because we need something to protect us. You know what I mean? Because we are in jungle environments, right? And if no, if somebody don't think you tough, but you want to hang around the tough guys, you're going to be in some trouble. So if you want to hang around the tough guys, you got to pretend to be tougher than you are. You know what I mean? Because nobody's really built, you know, even though some people play it off very well, nobody's really built for it because just the God did not create you for that purpose. So even if you're acting out in that way, it's not really what you're here for. So the identity crisis is real. So coming into who I really was, was so well received because imagine how something that's real looks when you place it next to a bunch of stuff that's not, right? Imagine you come into a jewelry store and a person has a bunch of fake jewelry laid out. And then somebody comes out and places a real diamond on that table. It's going to be like, well, wow, what is that? It's going to be brilliant. It's going to shine. It's going to be so different. So although people are not there for that real diamond, they can't afford that real diamond, they weren't looking for that real diamond, when they see it compared to the others, they're like, this is, you know, they'll embrace it. You know what I mean? And so I think that in my, in my, in my latest music, you know, um, after starting to serve God from like 2010 on, people have embraced the music in a different way because you could just tell it's real. Real is, real is something that's just next level. Think about it, right? The FBI, you know how they train their agents to spot fake money? They don't show them any fake money. They expose them to so much real money that when they see fake money, it stands out. Mm. You see what I'm saying? That's how they train them. You would think they would show them the counterfeit, right? And show them the difference. No, they show them so much. You got to count a million dollars cash, all kind of bills. So when that fake money, as soon as you touch it, oh, this is fake. So the real is just something different altogether. You know what I'm saying? So even though people may pretend not to embrace it or not to want it or even to want positivity, it's not true. I think the kind of music I'm doing now just pierces the soul in a whole different way. You know what I mean? So identity is found. Sometimes you don't find your identity in yourself. Sometimes you got to be showed truth and to recognize truth within yourself. Yes. So you did a play called Don't Count Me Out. Yes. And in that play, I, I read in my in my research that in this play, you were the only person who was not saved, but it was the genuine nature, nature of everyone around you that inspired you to find yourself. Yeah, yeah. It helped me find my identity in Christ because, first of all, the level, the, those people are operating under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The level of belonging that they made me feel I had not felt in any other environment. Okay. And I've been in so many environments, right? And it was nothing that seemed intentional. Nobody said nothing directly to me about it. Like, hey, you belong here. Or, hey, we're welcoming you. It wasn't like that. They just operated as who they are, having found their identity in Christ, right? Right. So just from being around them, just that spirit, right? Think about how contagious a smile is. Yeah. Right. That comes from the spirit. It's that kind of thing. So just being around them and saying, I'd rather be around these kind of people. And then what makes these kind of people, these kind of people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted to be that kind of person. And I wanted to be around more of those kind of people. You know what I mean? And so that's what I started surrounding myself with. It, it was pivotal. It was pivotal. And just my whole just really like getting saved and coming home and God was just pivotal. It was just like a door swung open. You know what I mean? And, and, and I just loved it. I, I loved the process. And I was reluctant doing it, of course. It's a stage play. You know what I mean? That's that. At the time, you know, it wasn't really much of a merger with that in hip hop. That's not hip hop. That's not cool. That's not tough to do. But I reluctantly did it and, and, and I never regret it. I beg to differ. That is hip hop. And, you're right, but that's I, not how I felt. I didn't know right. at the time, but you're right. I, and, and I wanted to get into that with you because 
now that we set the stage of who you are, mm -hmm. we're not going to touch the music yet, but we mm -hmm. are. I want to respect you as a man first because with Heritage Hip Hop, I believe if people can't get an idea of the artist, why would they ever want to get into your music? If 700 songs are released per day, I'm not going to sit down and listen to 700 songs to see what mm -hmm. I like. There's going to have to be yeah. something about the artist that makes me connect to them. That's a fact. And because um, I listen to all hip hop, I am not, I am not, a, uh, I don't like everything, but I do mm -hmm. give people their fair chance. Tap in though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very big on people using faith as a part of their message because I think people are full of shit. Part of my language. Yeah, I, think I know people, what you mean. I think people don't really live what they what they what they say. Cause you got mm -hmm. people who say they talk that street talk, and I know you heard that. Um, some uh, it, it sounds it sounds good, but your, your spirit not familiar. I don't feel you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you 100%. get that. You get that on faith too. Yes. And unfortunately, I think uh, we get a lot of that is because of Rayaboneism. Are you familiar with Rayabone? No. What's that? So Rayaboneism was King Solomon's son. Mm -hmm. And he told Solomon, Solomon told his son to listen to the elders and judge the people wisely. Mm -hmm. As Rehoboam basically did not listen to his father, he listened to the young men that was his kid as his people. It took the young men as counsel. So yeah, what happened mm -hmm. was Rehoboam did not listen to his father's words. He did not listen to the elders. And then the kingdom of Judah split. Yeah. And that's when the 12 tribes started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. I see that as a continuance today when it comes to anything of culture, when it comes to people of color, because that's part of the trauma that we have under the, mm -hmm. the, the let's just say, the pen and the economy of entertainment and how we use it. Yeah, yeah. How do you think the separation of identity and place within hip hop has caused the culture to fall on so many hard times when it comes to the talk of what hip hop's role in our community and culture is. I mean, well, that's the whole thing, right? If I can get you to lose your identity, I got everything about you. You're done. Mm -hmm. So it's all about who the people and what the people identify with. They want us to identify with the struggle. They want the struggle to be cool to us. They want it to be popular. They want violence to be normalized. They want us to be desensitized. And so they put it in our face, right? If they wanted us, whoever they is, powers that be behind this, if they wanted us to identify with educated people, with Pan-African people, with, with, with faithful people, with religious people, then they will promote that, right? So they know identity is everything. If you don't know who you are, that's it. That's why when, when, when one king destroys another king's area, what do they do? They destroy all the history, right? They get rid of the language. They, they kill the elders. They burn all the scrolls because we don't want you to know your history because if you know who you are, you're going to act differently. That's why people came talking, Peter, and listen, you are a royal priesthood. You know what I mean? Let me remind you who you are because if I remind you who you are, everything else, it, it becomes a short conversation. If you believe it, if you take that in and believe it, the conversation then becomes short because now you're going to act completely differently. So when they realize the power of hip hop, they begin to harness it and decide to shape our identity for us rather than the people in the community shaping our identity and kind of uh, letting us know who we are. You remember, you know, you had you had grandmothers and great grandmothers and stuff and, and tell you and they, and they had pride in their last name and they kind of gave you a certain dignity. So. You know, once you break the family down, you broke the neighborhood down because good neighborhoods have made a good families and families indeed, period. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. um, that's how they came at our identity by putting in front of us what they wanted us to identify with. I'm going to take someone who looks like you mm -hmm. and I'm going to put a gun in his hand. I'm going to put a chain on his neck. I'm going to put the clothes on his back that I want y'all to chase after. Whatever it is, you know, so we let them shape our identity rather than us saying, nah, and it's been a couple of times we've rejected certain stuff as a culture. You know what I mean? Yeah. Certain artists and certain images come out and we reject it, but we should embrace certain things and reject other things. We should have embraced your images like Tribe Called Quest more, X-Clan. We should have embraced um, Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff, right? 
I just heard a phrase that shaped. I literally just threw a whole album away and started from scratch for my next album called New Wine. I'm going to tell you what made me throw it away. Um, Herbie Lovebug, I think it is. That's the cat that puts salt and pepper in him on, right? Yep. All right. Um, okay. He said, they asked him why he did the kind of music he did, the salt and pepper stuff, the kid and play stuff, right? He said he realized that the kind of music you did was going to determine the kind of life you lived. All that music was fun. All that salt and pepper stuff, all that kid and play stuff, they were having a ball, right? So I said to myself, okay, so I got I to go deeper. I got to remember that with every song. Do I want to live this way? Is this the life I want to live? You know what I mean? And that's the only stuff I'm touching on. You can really shape your life through music. It's eternal. It's a power with music that can't be with anything else. I tell you, music is eternal. I tell you how we know that. There's music in heaven. Only eternal things are in heaven. That's why the flesh can't go. Only the spirit can. You know what I mean? So you're dealing with something eternal. You know what I mean? So it just has so much power to it that, you know, I wish I realized earlier and I want through my music and through my interviews and publications. I just want people to realize we got a lot of power and we cannot let people outside our culture shape our identity. Can't do it. I agree. And when I had to do my interviews, I always ask people what is hip hop. And I think you've mm -hmm. already touched on it. If you want to answer that, I'll let you answer it now. What is hip hop? <laughs> hip hop is a culture. You know, hip hop is a is a heartbeat. It's a it's a it, it, I, I want to say it's like it's, it's a spirit or something that affects the spirit. You know, hip hop is the most powerful force besides the spirit of God roaming the earth. If you ask me, we haven't seen any other influence like hip hop, like bottom line. Nothing compares to it. My answer is hip hop is God. That's deep. Now let me tell you how I break it down, and let's let's vibe. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Hip hop is God. That's why heritage hip hop is kind of named the way it is. Because I wanted to my faith to talk about hip hop as well. We are God's heritage, and our generation is hip hop. So hip hop has to be a heritage of God. So we are God's heritage, which is the heritage of hip hop. Period. And when you look at how we create hip hop, it comes in. I'm gonna use three examples. These are my main three examples, but I have many more. When you walk through life, you take a journey. How do you measure your journey? You measure it in how many what you take? Steps. Steps. When you write music and you see the G clef and the lines, mm -hmm. when you write the notes on the lines, what is that called? The notes. Yeah, when you write notes. the notes on the line, what is that called? I don't write music. Well, it's called a step. Okay. So it's synonymous. What's, mm -hmm. the, what's the most important part of the beat when you rhyme? You count the. Some people count like yeah, the metronome and you okay, know, that's a step. And that's and that's measured by the what, the drum. Yeah. So the drum is the heart of the beat. Mm -hmm. What is your heart? It's the drum that patterns your rhythm of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so if your rhythm is out of balance, you don't have harmony. Harmony yeah. is when your system comes together to create unity or sound, because you can have sound health. But if you make beats and music, you put together cadences and chords and wind instruments and beats and all that to make one unified track or sound or thought or creative or create or a creative monument. Mm -hmm. So that's called harmony. Yeah. These things reflect the nature of the most high because disease and when things are out of rhythm. And when we always say we don't enjoy music, we don't enjoy the rhythm. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I, I, you got a lot of, uh, there, there, there's a lot of truth, obviously. I mean, what you're saying is, is scientific. What I think, what you're, what you're really looking at, though, is the fact that there's one creator, right. right? So there's this synonymous, there's this connection, there's this synergy, if you will, of it all, because right. there is one ultimate creator. And, um, He's using materials that you see, like, right? Like, do you have a, a fish striped tiger or a tiger striped fish? You see what I'm saying? It's one, <laughs> it, you know what I mean? It's yeah. one creator. You know what I mean? So we're going to see him in everything. He's made his, his existence known through creation, right? And what I like what you said about the heart and the drum and everything is because the, the Bible says that, you know, out of the heart 
flows the issues of life, right? right? Which is a fact, you know. So that's the that's why that's the first thing to assess your whole situation. The first thing they do when there's anything wrong with you is listen to your heartbeat. That's, that's right. the first thing they do. That's right. Because this is gonna let us know so much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. that's why another thing going back to what I said before, listening to my old music, I'm like, wow, this is where my heart was at. Yeah. And then I identified it as an identity crisis because I said, well, that's not where my heart was at, but that's what I was trying to reflect. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not ashamed of it because 98% of the game suffers from the same thing. So let me you know? pick up let me pick up on your point right there. Cause mm -hmm. now I'm gonna reflect your career in one yeah. in one in one instance. Yes. What are what are trees for? To clean the air. What is grass for? Grass, I don't know. To clean the air. They both create air. So I didn't when know the that the grass clean the air too. Well, it's green. It's chlorophyll. Same thing trees do. Okay. So think about so think about this. The Most High protected you with everything you needed from above your head to even below your feet. So you were in perfect equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That's creativity, and that's yes. why he said, "Kirby Lovebug, salute." He said how he made music to reflect his life because nature reflects the Most High's love. So you give back to him through your creative influence. That's why the trauma and the identity crisis of hip hop is so hard especially on our youth is because somebody's dictating who we should be or what we should sound like but we're not able we're not really able to create freely and just uh, just make things to reflect the pain that we live through and people make money off of it that's why i'm so hard on christian hip-hop is because it's so necessary but it's not being treated or cultivated the way it should be do you agree with me I agree with you, and I agree that that's that it's real deep what you're saying because basically there's somebody standing in the way of what we should be giving back to God almost as worship. Here's a gift, and then we minister back to Him with that gift. But in the meanwhile, somebody comes in and ta and, and and taints that gift and 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 throws it off course. That's a dangerous position to be in, right? right? That's an evil. That's an evil stance. It's completely unrighteous, but. Um, even worse if we're doing it to ourselves. But yeah, you're right. You know, I agree. And I think that not only does Christian hip hop need a bigger platform, a bigger stage, more attention, um, those who create it need to be more more serious and intentional about the message, right? It can't just be where I'm showing you my rap skills and I'm throwing something about Jesus, you know, on the last bar. It can't be where I'm just here to entertain you. You know what I mean? It can't be where you might not even know I'm Christian from hearing my song. You know what I mean? It's such a pivotal time and it's such an important message, an important um, tool that it, that it has to be handled, you know, uh, more proficiently and more seriously, you know, and just just take it like a critical thing. Word up. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you how God had his hands on you in a way where you're different, but not quite different. Mm -hmm. I'm from a generation above you. All right. OK, so. My generation was the beginning of the change of thought when it came to this country. We weren't okay. the activists. We were more mm -hmm. of the we not beat of this. Yeah. <laughs> <You know what laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> so, so our generation was fostered by the 5% nation of guys on earth. Yes. And we were, and they were the offspring of the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So when we learned and listened to hip hop, we came off of the public enemy in our ex clan generation, and we had the five percent is the Wu Tang clan, right? Yeah, if you really listen to Wu Tang, Wu Tang was not about street life, they rapped about street things, but they also put faith and elements of spirituality in their stuff. Yeah, they didn't glorify any nonsense. So, you rocking with Raekwon was a I don't know if you ever picked up on it. Raekwon, Ghostface, Rizza, and, and Deck sometimes mm -hmm. you got they always talked about the mind and the heart of the man, rather than I got all this, I got all that. Mm -hmm. And you rocking with Raekwon as one of your favorites just showed me that your mind was a little ahead of the game because you weren't rapping just to rap, you were rapping for a, a purpose. Yeah. Tell me about that collaboration Fistful of Dollars and how that, how that marriage came together. Well, at the time, our um, my manager and his manager were actually uh, brothers. And rest in peace to Mel, that was his manager. And um, 
you know, so he told me like, like, yeah, you know, I could put that together because originally they had heard my music, they liked it, some of the some of the characters in Wu Tang, and so they were sending me all the clothes and stuff, you know what I mean? And I'll be rocking all the stuff, but then I'm like, yeah, I want to do this record. So we came to the lab, the beat is on, he's writing to it. I'm like, let me hear what you got. He like, no, let me hear what you got. He said, I'm already established. People on this gonna wait to see how you bust your gun. You know what I'm saying? So he's like, I'm going to make sure I want it to be a dope record. This ain't no back and forth. You know what I mean? This ain't no sparring match. This record got to be dope. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I spit my verse for him and he was like, yeah, let's do it. And bro, it was it was one of the it was the beginning of me no longer smoking weed. I had smoked with him and it was something that I was not prepared. It was black African hash. Bro, three days later, I'm still high. I call him on the phone. I say, bro, you got to tell me what we smoke because I'm about to go to emergency room. Right. He like, oh, no, nah, no, nah, you good. That's that black African hash. It'll go down. You know, what I mean, that's your first time smoking and it do last super long. I was like, man, these guys are some different, but you right. See them older generation cats on some different stuff. Couple generations up. So I had to be careful. It taught me a valuable lesson, right? Because I was in there just happy to be uh, parlaying with Raekwon, smoking whatever. I had a hundred guys in there with me. He had a bunch of guys in there with him. K Slate came through to do drops for the mixtape. So K Slate came through with a whole, yeah, it's just everybody was deep in there, man. It was, it was like a jungle in there. You know what I mean? Cause everybody just was wanting to hear how this record was going to come out. And then um, I think we gave the record to DJ Clue to premiere at the time. He had the Monday night mixtape. We gave it to him. He threw the fire engines on and premiered that record. And, you know, it, it was a good look. That, that that record was a good look. It was a good time. It was a uh, it was like a dreams come true moment for me, realizing that they can and realizing that one was actually coming true. I mean, I was a big Purple Tape fan. You know what I'm saying? Even before that, you know, just so to 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 be sitting in that place where I'm in high school, rocking to this guy, and a few years later, I'm in a lab collabing with him. It just showed me, you know, how quick life can change. And, you know, the fact that dreams can come true and there's no expiration date on them. You know what I mean? Interesting, because I really dissect hip hop, as you can tell. My mind is just. Yeah, I'm with that. Very in touch. The the gift that you have as a MC, you're not a rapper, you're MC. 100%. The, the gift that you have as an MC is you're a moment rapper. What's Let that? Me, exactly. You know how some people rap stories? <laughs> yeah. You don't. You're at moments. Okay. The difference between a story is somebody can tell you a story, you can either be there or not. When you mm -hmm. rap a moment, you can live it and, put, and get perspective in it. That's why yeah. people always tell you remember the moments, not the story. Mm -hmm. So you have a song. I'm trying to remember the song right now. I think it's on your new project with Jim Jones, where you're mm -hmm. talking about sitting somewhere and somebody was sent to get you, but you end mm -hmm. up saving him. Mm -hmm. in a conversation yeah see that story i can't relate to but that moment i can because in the moment you could take a person back to a dang i was either the person that was being talked to or the person doing the talking mm -hmm. why do you think hip-hop doesn't celebrate the moments we always celebrate the tragedy in the story i just think it's over people's head think about it when you think about an album like a jay-z album like reasonable doubt people are just now getting half of what he was saying you think of Nas, it was written. People are just now understanding. You listen to Life We Chose or something. You listen to Gave You Power even. Like, it, it, it's, it's over people's heads. I think that's the thing at the end of the day. But yeah, I had a cat, my man R.I.P., my man Big Toss from around my way told me one time, he said, bro, I got your mixtape. He said, I'm listening. I feel like I'm in a drop top, which I could feel the breeze. He said, I was in jail one time listening to this stuff. And, and I felt like I was in the car with you. And I've always been a person that studied imagery. You know what I mean? And just how to bring it. I'm detail oriented. You know what I'm saying? That's why I like cars like Lamborghinis. You know, not to floss on people, not to stunt, not because it's expensive, but because like, look at the stitching, look at the attention to detail. It's stuff about that that most people wouldn't even notice, so you don't need it. 
That's what this lady told me one time. Um, when, when I was in a club, the first time I ever sipped Bev Clico, I was like, what's Bev Clico? She was like, if you don't know it, you don't need it. And I'm like, wow. You know what I'm saying? That's deep. You know what I mean? I know she got that from somewhere. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, it's all about detail, you know, and what do you know about something? Some people could tell you everything about a certain car from the engine to the this, that, and third. I'm just attention to the detail. I remember pulling up in a Gallardo when a guy is coming. Oh, man, this is the such and such Gallardo with the such and such engine. I don't even know about the engine. That's not the part that fascinates me. But the inside, the interior, and the attention to detail. And so when I write, I write to bring your attention to the detail. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's why I'm going to talk about the cigar smoke in the air. I'm going to talk about the scent. You're going to be able to smell the room that I'm describing. And if you can't, then it's not that. My man Money Mount told me one time, he said, bro, your music is like a movie that you watch with your ears. You know what I mean? And, and that's where I want to be. Exactly. And that's why I think most Christian hip hop sucks. <laughs> it's trash. It no, it's trash. And, and yeah. the reason, and you know why it's trash? Because people sacrifice God for entertainment when God is supposed to be the joy that makes you entertain. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I, I hate that. Well, won't you tell them how you really feel? <laughs> I'm a, uh, that's why I'm talking to you because listen. Oh man, I respect your music highly. I appreciate. I'm that. a person who's very look. Look, I'm I'm not petty, but I'm very meticulous. And if I don't mm -hmm. like something. You could you like your song could be good, and if one person messes up a hook, I'm good. I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm good. <laughs> I'm the type of person like either, either do that over or I'm it's not for me. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit about me, I got into my faith in like the two early two thousands. Okay. And they remember I was going through a music cleanse. And I stopped listening to hip hop and everything. So I missed yeah. the Dipset era. I missed the Lil Wayne era. I missed all that because I was working on me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I got introduced to Christian hip hop, right? Yeah. When I say Christian hip hop for me was like the vaccination needle going out right now, I yeah. couldn't take it. It was horrible. It was bad. But I got some good um people to listen to. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, we'd like to shout out like Bizzle, God Over Money Movement. Yeah. They're okay. Yeah, I haven't listened to much of his stuff, but one person I do love is The Truth. Yeah, yeah. I love The Truth. I love Dayton. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> and let me think who else I came across. I like Say Lot of Corner. And um, yeah, he's I, can't, all right. I, can't, I can't say I listen to much else. You know, you know why you can't? Cause it's trash. You can say it. It's all right. It's trash. Cause gospel hip hop, is. gospel hip hop, or Christian hip hop is like saying the word nigga to a lot of people. It's like a byword. Yeah. It's like you can't mm -hmm. really mess with it. And, and yeah. the reason, and the reason why I wanted to, um, I really wanted this interview. Well, I wanted four reasons for this interview. For one, I want to expose believers that to um artists that make good music. For one, appreciate it. Two, I want to show everybody that hip hop is not just what they think. Because a lot of people I talk to say, I don't like hip hop. I say, why? Because all they do is talk about sex, drugs, and murder. I was like, that's not hip hop. Mm -mm. So I don't think you know what hip hop is. And we have that conversation. No. Mm -hmm. The third reason is because I want to teach hip hop. Because if we don't really learn our gifts, our strengths, and even our weaknesses, we'll never truly know what our, our worth and our value is to not only others, but to ourselves. Yeah, I agree. And number four, I believe anything that has to do with God and uplifting the community needs to be shared more than the sex, drugs, and murder that is given to us freely. 100%. So when I heard of Bizzle, I checked him out because he had the song where he dissed Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got into him. I got into Lavoisier. I got into Stephen the Levite. I got introduced to Show Baraka, Flame, Seven, a whole bunch, Lecrae, a whole bunch of people. And then even in New Jersey, I got introduced to you. I got introduced to Fire Jaws. I got introduced to Brother Everlast. I got introduced to a lot of people, right? And the one thing I seen that happens, oh yeah, shout out to Bria Miles too. The one thing that happens when it comes to faith and music is that people take the entertainment value of it out just to give a message. So then you're not mm -hmm. rapping, you're preaching, and then you come out of your element, which is- yeah. Which is like we said, if I don't feel you, 
I don't get you. Or they take the they take your heartbeat. If the pulse ain't correct, then I can't mess with it. Yeah. How do you keep your finger on the pulse so you don't overgo the music you make and sacrifice it to the ear that you want to catch? Um, because I don't think about them. I'm thinking about does this song please God? I'm thinking about how many people are on earth and that this message I'm conveying, it's more likely that there's millions who relate. There's going to be millions who don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, it just is what it is. So my thing is, although I might feel like something I'm going through is so personal, I know it's a whole bunch of people who can relate. You know what I mean? So uh, my, my thing isn't to do people pleasing music. My thing is to have faith in the talent and the gifting I know God gave me so I don't have to worry if people are going to feel it. I know people are going to feel it. And, and I'm not a cocky individual. You could tell by now I'm relatively humble, but I know I'm better than 99% of these guys. And I know that gift comes from God. So I don't necessarily brag about the gift itself. You know what I mean? Because it's a gift. You can't brag about a gift because I wouldn't have it unless somebody gave it to me. But when I listen to people's music, I listen to mine, I'm like, y'all are too conscious of what people might like. Okay. And that's never what's won. That's never what's won. Because think, the classic music that's legendary in hip hop, they didn't even have no way to have those analytics. So what were they doing music based on? Fact. They were doing music based on the heart, the soul, the reality. Now, I mean, and they didn't even know what people would think. Okay, so, so let me ask you a question then. myself. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question then. The why there's so many people beat suck and they want to rap over it then and put God in it and now I have to listen to it and respect it because you put God into it. No, you don't have to, but exactly <laughs> people people think that, that that's the same. That's how people are. It's manipulative. What happens when, when people go to court? They put a suit on, they get a haircut, and they talk about how they just been going to church and work. You know what I mean? Because they think, okay, I can, yeah, I, I can, I can get you to sympathize with me over this. I can get you to listen because the message is more important to you than the fact that I can't rap, and that that don't fly with me. You know what I mean? I listen to some old school uh, BDP before I listen to a lot of this trash. You know what I mean? I mostly just listen to my own music and, and instrumentals to tell you the truth, jazz. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. that. I'm just my 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 taste is eclectic, but at the end of the day. You know, I think people think they can get it off. And I do also think that they think they're talented. And I stopped commenting on who is and who isn't because there's millions of people bopping to trash. So who am I to call it trash? I just got to do what I do. No, you're, being, you're telling the truth. You are right to call something trash. But you're also right to say it's not for you. So there's yeah, two right, different yeah. elements to that. I agree because a person's picking through the garbage, they might find something, but it's still garbage to me. Right. Like, like, <laughs> you know let me I mean? ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Like, like, look, this is what I do. It's it's a blessing to find a song you could play for everybody. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So the when kids. I wanna, right. So when I want to teach hip hop to my family, when I'm in the car with my grandson or something, I'm not playing Wu Tang because I know that's over his level. Mm -hmm. But I'll play Trial Call Question De La Soul. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's very rare where music hits people on all levels at the same time. Well, one of my earliest mentors told me that you're really going to come into yourself when you make music that can go from 8 to 80. That's what he would call it. Facts. If people from 8 to 80 can enjoy it, then it's good. And so that's what I focus on, too. I send it to 60-year-old bishops. I might send a song to Bishop Hilliard. What you think about this? Then I send a song to my 12-year-old nephew. Then I send it to my 26-year-old brother. I, if everybody feel it, then I'm like, okay, cool. You got to be, you got to be, that's the other thing, too. Some people are too hard on themselves, and some people take no critique. And they don't criticize. They ain't critical at all. <laughs> You see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, who was in the studio with you? You got to run it back by, by certain people who are honest, truthful, who have taste <clears throat> and see what they say about it. And then I think, you know, you'll, you'll have something going for That's what I do. You know, I even run stuff by pastors and say, OK, did I go too far with this message? Are you getting this message? You know what I mean? Am I reaching by, by trying to convey like even with that song, Money on My Head? I'm like, is this is this going too far? And they're like, this is this is this is a great story. You know what I mean? And you got the message across to see just, it's just how God flips things, turns tables. 
You know what I mean? So it's like, you got to run stuff by, I guarantee you people ain't running music by nobody honest. If anybody. They just, in a, a lot of people just home recording alone and they have no critics. Then other people got critics with no taste. The other people got critics that don't care about them enough to tell them that's trash. Right. But then it, then sometimes something comes out and does numbers and I'm just boggled. So I'm out of the conversation about what's hot. Because if if something that's not hot can do numbers that makes a person a millionaire, I'm staying out the conversation. I'm baffled. I don't want you to. And I'm gonna tell you why. Things Hard. make th- no things pop because of money behind it. Yeah. And, that, and that's gonna take us into Godify. Because mm-hmm. at least what I said earlier was that Christian hip hop and a lot of music doesn't have an entity that's really there for them to foster, create, outlet. nurture, mm-hmm. and be an outlet for them to be creative and to produce music for everybody to hear. When I think of Christian hip hop, I think of Rapzilla. Mm-hmm. Look into the camera. Yeah. Crash. Yeah, I see. And what I you're support saying. I support Rapzilla though because we need that. It's necessary, mm-hmm. but it's trash. Yeah. It's trash. Yeah. And, and and when you put out, I saw the thing like two years ago about Godify. Yeah. I was like, hmm, you know what? That's something that somebody should have done years ago, but I'm glad somebody's mm-hmm. doing it now because yeah. now if somebody wants to know, well, I don't want to listen to this, but where can I find this? Mm-hmm. Now we have now we have an answer. We want to become a one-stop shop. You need right. your own. You know, I've always been that way. When it came to uh, distribution with my own music before I got signed, I I looked for my own outlets. You know, so it it, it was the natural thing to do for me was that why are we relying on secular platforms? Why do I have to see this R&B artist titties while I'm on my way to look for a Hillsong song? Right. You know what I mean? Why? why I can't even just uh, hand a kid the phone without knowing they got to sift through this nonsense. So I'm like, we need our own. And I'm a visionary. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think things are impossible. So if I need $3 million to, to build the app, I'm just, I, I just move forth in faith. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day. And so we're going to get where we're going. You know, nothing's an overnight process. Half of the problem is it's also not enough unity. You know what I mean? Even in Christian hip hop or gospel music itself. Because everybody should have came rushing to the platform when you think about how many people know about it. Now, a lot of people are on there. You know what I mean? We got thousands of songs on Godify. You know, thousands of sermons. There's hundreds of podcasts, bunch of mixes. It's international. It's available on every continent. You see what I'm saying? It's global. So at the end of the day, we getting where we going. But um, we needed our own outlet. So when I want this kind of music, I know exactly where to go. You know what I mean? So that's what we created it for. I I salute you for that because it's deeper than just that. You said unity. Unity, Mm -hmm. lack of unity is part of the PTSD that has killed us since colonialism by far. I agree. You know? And when I say colonialism, I don't mean just Western Hemisphere stuff. I mean Romans, Greeks, Persians, all that. It's been unity, lack of unity in a different way since then. Yes. And there's one thing that I got from your new your your newest your newest project out right now. Give me one second. I gotta get to my notes. Mm-hmm. It's called This Far by Faith, right? Yes, yes. And it, has, it has Jim Jones as the host, right? Yes. There's a story on there where he talks about where he had to go get Easter clothes and he mm-hmm. didn't get the outfit he was supposed to get. Yeah. And, and he, he basically took his um his outfit and his sneakers, and it wasn't given to him until he earned it. Mm-hmm. A lot of hip hop nowadays, and a lot of things in the hip hop culture, is not earned. What's yeah, the not. What's the one thing you earned that made you a better artist and a better businessman today than you were when you first started? Um, I think respect. You know what I mean. That's something that that had to be earned, and it's from legends. You know what I'm saying. Having legends call you a legend. I never called myself a legend. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then you run into certain legends and they like, yo, you a Jersey legend. And you like, you will, you know, coming from you, it's real. But I've earned that respect from staying true to the craft, from not jumping on every trend, every wave and becoming trendy and weird. You know what I'm saying? By, by finding my own path and sticking to it, no matter what, by making the sacrifice, walking away from secular record deals to take this path. 
You know what I mean? People respect that but in the game because they know in the game they know how hard it is to get a meeting. They know how hard it is to get a negotiate to the point where you actually sign. They know how hard it is to get in these circles where you writing for puff, where you producing for certain individuals. And so at the end of the day, to walk away from that, people respect it and they say, yo, anybody who could do that, that's just a real manly thing. You know what I mean? So I think respect is something that I earned. And since I earned it and the way that I earned it, it's like you never lose it. You catch that legendary status and you never lose it. You know what I mean? And um, so it's always going to be that stepping that stepping stone. It's like a foundation that that God laid for me that I'll always be able to build on. You know what I mean? So um, I, I'm grateful for it. You just said something that sparked my interest. You were called a New Jersey legend. Yeah. Why are there New Jersey legends in hip hop and Jersey don't know their legends? Yo, I wouldn't say Jersey don't know. I would say it depends on your age group and the type of person you are. Okay. Because I came in the game studying the game. Like, so I knew about Chill Rob G. You know what I mean? I knew about certain individuals. I I, I always pay respect. You know what I mean? Double X Posse and different people that, you know, poor righteous teachers, people that don't really get mentioned as much with the Naughty by Natures and et cetera. Because I'm a student of the game. And that art has been gone. There's no student. So the new cats come in. They don't even know who paved the way for them. They don't even know why people are even looking in a direction. And it's because of people that came before them. You know what I mean? It's, it's disrespectful. You know what I mean? These young is it's disrespectful. Our era was not disrespectful. We came and respected those who popped, even though they wasn't popping no more. You know what I mean? Because it, we know they laid the path for us. The only reason anybody's looking and this direction for artists is because of what that guy did. You know what I mean? So it's not that you owe him but money, but you owe him respect. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, that's the thing at the end of the day. It's whoever's tuned in, too. Some people just out the loop, man. Some people just out the loop. Where you be like, you know, a guy asked me the other day, one of my favorite producers, I said, KG, what did he produce? You just out the loop. You know what I'm saying? You just out the loop. You know, I can't be mad at people for being out the loop. A lot of people are out the loop. And that's how I always felt. You know what I mean? When I was doing numbers with Welcome to New Jersey and Welcome to New Jersey Part 2, my mixtape, if a person didn't know about it or hadn't heard about it, okay, you just wasn't tuned in. That ain't that don't lessen what I did. Like you just said, you, you had tuned out a lot of stuff in the early 2000s, right? So stuff that was going on, you just might not have been in tune with it. It don't take away from what it was. You know what I mean? So that's how I look at it. You know what I mean? But, yo, I really enjoyed this convo, man. I got to run. I got another one that was supposed to start at three. But <laughs> okay. this was this was, you know, I'm sure we we, we probably could go on all over. We're going to have to do this again. Yeah. When you put this out, people are going to be looking forward to the part two. We so. have to do a part two. Let's do we it. We got to do it. We got to do it. Um, This has been my most enjoyable interview of the year. Salute. So um, I, I love this conversation. I'm glad I did this. I'm glad you invited me. I appreciate your platform. Um, anything I could do to, to push the platform, please let me know as well. And um, let's connect again soon, man. Um, I got to jump on another call or whatever. But um, yeah, I wish I had more time because it's more than what I was expecting. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, honestly, exactly. I'm just I, I'm about to go to another one and answer all the same questions I answered all week in other interviews, but this one was different. You know what I'm saying? Thank so um, I appreciate you, brother. I love what you're doing. So let's connect again very soon. You got my information. So let's stay in tune. All right, no doubt, man. Salute. Peace. Peace. All right, everybody. So he had to go, but I thank you for tuning in to the Heritage Hip Hop interview today with Nucci Rayo. You can find him on all social media under Nucci Rayo. Let me get my notes. He has Nucci Rayo, the King's kid.com where you can get his music. You can get um, some information about him. He has a new project out right now with Jim Jones. Uh, this far by faith. I don't know if you can see it on my title. I mean, I want to, I want a sponsorship title for that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, support the, support the, support my man as anybody out there who is Christian and looking for, Christian hip hop, you got new Chi Rayo. That's a good look right there. It's I love the kingskid.com. That's his website. I love the kingskid.com. 
So make sure you support them. And I thank you for following Heritage Hip Hop on this interview. You can support us by going to heritagehiphop.com, becoming a, a subscriber. We are Heritage Hip Hop on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Um, just Google me. I'm out there. Follow my SEO, Heritage Hip Hop. But right now, I'm on Heritage Hip Hop on boomuit.com at B O O M U I T T dot com for Heritage Hip Hop. All right. Uh, anybody with a video out, if you give me your video, I'm verified. Blue checked on Boom You It. You get 350 streams on Boom You It. Um, on my channel, single deal on the table from Rampage of the Flipmo Squad and his new label. So it's out there. Uh, so uh, once again, we give a salute. If you want to buy some apparel, storefrontier.com forward slash heritage hip hop. You see it in the end of this video. But our video today was sponsored by Shakai Clothing. Look for the hyena, y'all. Shakai Clothing. See that right there? They supported us and we got some some good stuff. They go that little hyena right there. Look for Shakai Clothing. And salute to Brother Everlast, another Christian rapper. Total Truth Apparel. You know what I'm saying? Hoodies, hats, shirts, all that. You know what I'm saying? When you see that, Total Truth Apparel, check them out. So once again, we out of here, everybody. I didn't get to do the rapid, the rapid fire questions, so wait till he comes back and we're going to get him with that. So for everybody out there watching, this is Karef from Heritage Hip Hop saying peace and we out. Thank you for watching our presentation. We ask that you subscribe to our YouTube family and hit the notification bell for updates. Please like, comment, and share this video.